Sejam todos muito bem-vindos a mais uma transmissão do Instituto Vida para Todos. Be all welcome Nós to one more live broadcast of the Institute Life for All Institute. Today we're enjoying message 17, which has a general subject of the word of life, the fellowship of life, and living stones for edification. We're enjoying the epistles of the Apostle John and the Apostle Paul. And today, we will be enjoying shepherd and overseer of your souls. But before I get started, I would like to speak about the burden uh, disclosed this morning. You, all, you have all received the sheet about the kingdom investors. But I like to speak to everyone and highlight that we all need to change our mentality and our mindset concerning the needs of the work of the Lord. And we need to have a vision that the work of the Lord on this earth Um, it's executed by the church. And who is the church? We are the church. Therefore, the financial need of the work, it needs to take care of the advancement of the Lord's work in the entire earth. And we cannot delay the work of the Lord because of our delay. The Lord, when he wants to do his work, he would certainly supply the uh, financial resources. But how does he do this? He does it through us, those who touch the work of the Lord. So the first, the first change in mindset that we need to have is that whoever is involved in the work is not only one person. We all are involved in the work. And the Lord is not is not uh, counting with a multimillionaire person or a billionaire billionaire person. The Lord doesn't operate that way. The Lord doesn't operate under that principle. The Lord wants to count with all the members of the body, with each member of the body of Christ. And that is why it is an honor. It is a privilege for all of us to participate in the participate in the advancement of the work of God with our financial resources. In Luke chapter 8, we see these women that took care of all the Lord's needs while he was here on earth. The Lord never spoke about that. But they were readily available to prepare everything that was needed in order to preach the gospel, all the logistics, all the needs, and all the necessary um, money to operate. And it is under that same principle that the Lord wants all of us to operate. The Lord wants to supply through us. And if we truly have a heart of bringing the Lord's back, we cannot allow that there will be no resources to bring the Lord back. So now, why, why was there a need or how did this need come about about the investors of the kingdom? It's because the kingdom of the heavens need to be, needs to be expanded. And it needs to be expanded so that the Lord can come back. So the kingdom investors are um, portions of $100 each. And even if you consider that you're not a person that has the money or you don't have the resources, you should pray. And the Lord will say to you, I do have, I, you do have the resources. I will supply to you. And you will be surprised in what the Lord can do in your life and your financial life. And when we brought this up a couple months ago, and we had some fellowship with some, some of the regions that were starting the uh, investors of the kingdom, 
with one of the regions with only a few a few cities and a few states they were only thinking about raising about 30 30 portions and we encourage them no you you need to be able to raise between uh, 200 to 300 portions inst installments or portions of these of these uh, vote they were not even in the region they were in Sao Paulo in a meeting and in, within that weekend they went from 30 30 um, subscriptions or 30 brothers and sisters registered to 200 200 participating especially the sisters the sisters surprise us a lot because sisters are more practical they might be very practical in their spending at home, but for the Lord, they are ample. They give with their whole heart. And sometimes it's better to speak with sisters than with brothers concerning this aspect. So let's change this, this mentality. This region needs to be one of the regions with the most, the most allotments, the most uh, portions. And the Lord is going to give you this opportunity to be redeemed. And you can, we can challenge the Lord right now. Because it's, this is the only aspect in which the Lord says, try me, and I will open the gates of heaven. And I will provide all that you need, and these, these resources are going to pass through you. And you'll be able that you you will see that you will be able to do not only one installment or one portion, but two, three, or many more. We need to believe, and we need to believe that the Lord can use you to bring resources to the entire uh, to His work to expand His work on the entire earth. As indeed, it is happening. In one week, a week and a half, we are going to South Africa. Why? Because the Lord has used the resources of the churches. And you know that in Africa, during these two and a half years, in this new, new, uh, uh, new era, new time, this new, this new time the Lord has opened to us, the Lord has provided resources to many, many of the saints, all the churches. And we're going to continue. So you need to be also an investor of the kingdom. And I know of brothers in Sao Paulo who have 30, 30 of these installments. So do not, do not um, underestimate what the Lord is giving you. And yes, there is some brothers and sisters that cannot provide necessarily an installment of um, $100. But maybe you can do 10 or 20 or, or $30. Well, you still participate. And that's why there is partners of the gospel. And then there is partners of the gospel kids. It's for also us, for us to show our kids and teach our kids to participate in the work of the Lord with financial resources. Maybe with 50 cents, one dollar, they start to generate and develop a culture in which they are going to become partners of the gospel. These might be um, you utilized for the region, for the work in the region, the work in your area. So let us not let us not uh, get behind. Let us not be left out. Where our heart is, um, where our treasure is, there our heart lies. So I really wanted to, to help everybody. I wanted to make sure that everybody understands the burden. And if you've already participating, you know, challenge the Lord and even increase your your quota, increase your portion. Uh, so do not use your logical mind and do calculations. Challenge the Lord. But also, I like to to speak about the young people's conference and teenagers. We're no longer going to do two separate periods or two separate uh, portions. 
we're going to do one one meeting, uh, one one conference together between between both the teenagers and the older young people, young adults. And these teens, they love the Word of God. They are focused on the Word. They have a reverent word for love for the Word. And the Lord has been blessing them for their simplicity and their love for the Word. So we have considered that there is no need for us to separate our young adults from our teens. And they are going to help each other. They are going to, there might be some uh, meetings or activities that might be separate due to their time, time range. But they are going to be together. It's going to start on a Thursday and it's going to finalize on a, on a Sunday with um, the meeting for the Sunday message with the prophetic word. And then the the um, older the older uh, brothers and sisters intendants that are taking care of the young people they also need to participate. And since there is a smaller group of days, more people can participate. Let us prepare from now for all the young people to participate. And also, during, during the conference, the conference in September, in February, during the month of February, we are having a very intense schedule during our conferences. And all the elders and, and leading ones of all the churches are, are following closely the, all the conferences. So, we are going to di di diminish the amount of days of the international conference. So, we have felt that there is a need, there is no need for us to have the conference for full nine days. And we could do a conference of, of not having to ask for more holidays or vacation. We're thinking about starting on Friday evening and then do the conference between Saturday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. And in that way, we can fill, fill all the uh, the stancia, all the conference conference venue, and we can fill it with more brothers and sisters. And in September, we're planning to do the same. So, be prepared for those changes or those upcoming changes for the Young People Conference and the International Conference. And let us work from now to bring the most amount of, of brothers and sisters and start to get, get them ready, start breaking, breaking down uh, into, into installments, into smaller payments, or, or maybe open up, opening up like a savings account for them to start saving for the conference in February. And I believe the Lord is going to bless us even more and there, there will continue to be the agenda positiva, which means the positive agenda, to stay close, following closely the prophetic word through the conferences, even in presence, even by being there in person. So, we have arrived to 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 11. I do not need to repeat the burden of, of Peter. Peter was speaking to the Jews, to the believers, and he had perceived himself that in his natural man, 
He would have no way to follow the Lord and to serve the Lord. And he realized there will be a need for transformation. And those that serve the Lord cannot serve the Lord in their natural man. So us, that we were regenerated and we have been regenerated for a living hope, the Lord is now... Uh, refining us and removing all impurities and sometimes we do not understand why there is so many difficulties or where we're going through cer certain things and now you're loving the Lord and following the Lord and following the word closely but truly the Lord wants to purify you the Lord wants to Make sure that your faith, your faith is uh, refined and all impurities are removed. And truly the Lord will, will obtain the salvation of our soul. So when the church arrives to this condition, all of us as the overcomers as I hope that we all all will belong to this group of overcomers I believe we are all a group of people that desire to be the overcomers we will be reigning with the Lord even we will be spared of the great tribulation by that time we should already be in the heavens with Christ, with the Lord. And I believe and I hope that all of us are part of that and that's why we're fighting here on earth, on earth for that. But in order for us to do that and for us to, to obtain such a life, we need to remove all these negative things described in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. 1 through 9, especially in verse 1, it starts speaking about removing, laying aside malice, deceit, and other things. And in verse 2, it speaks about the desire of the pure milk, the pure milk of the word. And then we read Isaiah chapter 66 in verse 2, which speaks about the condition for us to really grow and to achieve the full salvation and we saw that it depends of a heart that is afflicted contrited and blessed are those who are who are contrite in spirit because of those is the kingdom of the heaven so if you want to participate of this, uh, of the reality of the kingdom of the heaven, we need to have an open spirit, an empty spirit. Meaning, those that, be, that, be, that believe that they are in themselves capable, the Lord cannot use them. But those who realize that they are completely incapable, that they are not useful, that they are those who deny the Lord three and three times. Those are the ones the Lord, the Lord, the Lord is using and can use, because they don't depend on their capacity. And when He finds those type of people, He can then find Himself at home. And the base for that is to have a reverent love for the Lord. And it is because of those conditions that the Lord is blessing our young people. And he's, you know, he, this, this, um, this is passing around to the entire church, this attitude. So I would like to remind everyone that Peter here, was speaking to a group of people, Jews, believers, that were scattered around different nations and countries. And so Peter was speaking to them how they should behave. 
in the midst of these nations. So, you see here in verse 11. Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. So you understand why. Sojourners and pilgrims, because they were dispersed. A stain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. Having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. So those who are pilgrims are Jews, are believers, believers that were scattered. But to be honest, this is for all of us. We were all, we are all pilgrims. In Hebrews, chapter 11, 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the places which he would receive as inheritance, and he went out, not knowing uh, where he was, where he was going. He received the promise and then started going to a place that he didn't know. For he waited for the city which was, which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. So Abraham did not have a, a hope of a material material home or a material nation. Abraham's hope was placed in a city that has foundations which has foundations whose builder and maker is God. In verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the, the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. Verse 15, And truly, if they called to mind that country, for which they had come out, they would have had the opportunity to return. So, even though we're not these Jews that were, you know, exiled or were dispersed, our nation is heavenly. Um, a house, a nation, pardon me, a nation that has now foundations founded by God, built by God. So it's not worth it for us to invest so much on this earth. Live with, with what is needed. If you need a big house and the Lord knows your necessity, he will supply it. The Lord will give it to you. If you need a car, the Lord will provide you the car you need. But let's not have a heart of investing our lives and everything in the, on this earth. Let's invest in the kingdom because our nation is not of this earth, it's heavenly. And this is why the feast the Jews have is the Feast of the Tabernacles, the last of the year. And you see, the Jews are the richest people on all earth. And they may have so many things. But when they go to the, taber the Feast of the Tabernacles, they need to let go of all their material things. 
and they're going to uh, stay in tents like everybody else, like all the Jews, to have a simple life during that feast. Have you ever camped in your life? Have you ever gone camping? You cannot take a lot of things. You cannot do a lot of things or bring a lot of things with you. Right? You got to be simple. You got to keep it simple. You, you got to be simple. You cannot bring all your uh, elements of comfort that you have at home. You bring water. You bring a backpack. You bring a sleeping bag. And then you, you, you're there like you're there uh, in a simple way. So on this earth, you know, we, are, we, are, we have to be simple. We have to live like if we live in a campground. I'm not talking about not having a house or a car. The Lord will supply what you need. But let us commit ourselves to live a life of a pilgrim. We're pilgrims on this earth. Let's invest all our resources that we can into the kingdom of the heavens. We are investors of the kingdom. Amen. So, while we live on this earth, we are of the, of the heavenly places, but we're still on this earth. So, while we live on this earth, we're still subject to the influences of this earth. So this is why I have spoken in John chapter 17. The Lord spoke and prayed to the Father that those that the Father gave him, he's not going to lose anyone. But he said something in verse 14. I have given you, I have given them my word. And what we need is the word. And the Lord said, I have given them the word. And the world, the word, the, the word that is abiding in us, right? The word that the Lord supply is hated by the world. So think about this. We are not of this world. Just like the Lord Jesus is not from this world. So in verse 15, the Lord says, I ask you that you would not take him away from the world, but that you should keep them from evil. Why do we need to be here on this earth? Well, because still the Lord wants to save our soul. But also because the Lord needs me to invest in the kingdom to preach the gospel, and to be a, a fruitful branch to rescue many other people. But the Lord didn't take us from this world. But he prayed to the Father that we would be kept from the evil and the evil one. And the, verse, the, 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 the following verse says, They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. So here, twice the Lord spoke, they're not from this world. So this is, this is a statement, a confirmation. We're not of this world, but we do still live on the world. We still live in this world. And because we still live in this world, the world might still occupy our hearts. And so there is a struggle. There is this fight. So this fight and this struggle is not let's just read it Ephesians chapter 6 Ephesians 6 12 our fight our battle is not with or against flesh or blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. They are, 
they act in the world because they that's the realm of their action. And I live in this world where they have dominion over. So do you understand the danger here? We live in a world where those that have power are principalities, powers, and those rulers of the darkness. So this is why the Lord Jesus asked the Father, do not take them away from this world, but keep him from the evil one. What evil? This evil presented here in Ephesians. So in this fight with against the evil one, we need to understand what type of fight this is. So Peter speaks like this, to abstain from these fleshly passions that battle or fight against the soul. Because these, um, these passions fight against your transformation. They fight against or oppose your the salvation of your soul. What does the world want to do? It wants to occupy your heart. So we need to understand the world occupies your wants to occupy your heart. And that's why the evil one uses. The evil one uses the world as an instrument to occupy our heart. In the same way that we have tools like the, the colporting, the teens house and the teens, well, the world also has a tool. Excuse me. The evil one has a tool, which is the world, to overcome us and occupy us. So we cannot let that the, we cannot let the world today use the world to occupy our hearts. Why does one that God want to obtain uh, to save our hearts? Why do both the Lord and Satan take control of your heart? Why is your heart so important for God? Why is for God your God your God your heart so important? Because the heart is the ground where God can sow the seed of the kingdom. So then the kingdom will grow. And God will establish his kingdom here on earth. And then he will automatically expel the kingdom of Satan. And that's why Satan opposes it and fights us. And he wants to occupy your heart to stop stop it or to damage it for not so that it would not receive the seed of the kingdom where can we find this affirmation that our heart is the soil or the ground where God can sow it's Matthew Matthew chapter 13 this is not just a story for for a Sunday's kids message so Matthew 13, verse 19. Even though that this part is explaining something on a negative aspect, we can find all the definitions here. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches it away that was sown in his heart. So what was sown in his heart? The seed of the kingdom that was sown by the Lord Jesus as the sower. If you see in verse 13, the Lord says, uh, verse 18, therefore here, the parable of the sower, and the sower went out to sow, and part of it fell on the on on the on the path on the wayside. But he he who receives the seed on a stony place, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. 
yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while, so on and so forth. And that's where the Lord explains that the seed is the seed of the kingdom and the, the soil in which this seed is planted is the heart of man. And this is why, brothers and sisters, God here tells us that he needs to establish to establish the gospel of the kingdom and to establish the kingdom in our hearts and the Lord wants to gain your heart and gain the, pe the, the heart of the people. So when we go out and do immersion with people on the streets and pray for them with the immersion, with the prophetic word, what are we doing? The Lord is using us to gain the heart of the people. And their heart needs is a, a, a soil to receive the, the seed of the kingdom. And this incorruptible seed needs to go inside of these hearts to grow. And Satan doesn't want that. He will use everything he can to to bar us or or not allow us to accomplish this. And I hope I'm being able to change the, the way in which you think. The heart is the battleground because both God and the enemy wants it. Satan wants to damage your heart and occupy it so that the seed won't grow. But God wants to restore your heart and sow the seed of the kingdom so that it will grow. I also want to say something else. As I was preparing this message, in the past, the way that I understood this parable was that God you know, somebody came to sow, the Lord Jesus sowed, the cold porter sowed, and, and I thought that there were different types of, of earth, so when you found someone, they would have one of these different types of hearts. You have the, the heart that is, that the seed fell by the wayside, then you have the rocky, the rocky soil. Then you have the 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 land or soil with thorns, and then the good the good earth, the good land, the good ground. And we always said, "Oh, I want to be the good soil." And so you thought, or I think, I used to think that every time I would go out, I would find people with one of these conditions. But now I understand that this seed was already sown in me. I'm not sure if you understand. These four types of soil speak of your story. It's not for different people. It's your story. The Lord one day sowed the seed of the kingdom in your heart. And you believed in the gospel. And you were saved. And today you have the incorruptible seed in your heart. But mainly, it is still confined in your human spirit. So your heart participated only in this first moment for you to receive the Lord and be regenerated. But after that, this seed hasn't grown much. Why hasn't it grown? Why? Because your heart is just like the heart by the wayside. So why? He explains. The Lord Jesus then explains why this, what this heart means in verse 19. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, there is so many that already have the seed inside of them. And the prophetic word comes and many people don't understand it. Or they don't even pay attention to it. They don't really. It's like they're, they're receiving Greek. They're listening in Greek and they don't want to even understand. It, are they Christians? Yes. Will they continue to be Christians? Yes. But this word is by the wayside. So much traffic day by day. There is no time to comprehend the word. Oh, I have no time to hear the word. I have no time to do transcription. No time to do to do immersion. 
I have no time to even do immersion or, or hear, listen to the word. And this seed remains there, halted. Now, a little better, you see verse 20. But he who received the seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Oh, this is a little better. You know, someone, oh, I received the word. I was, I was brought to a meeting. Wow, this word is so good. I receive it with joy. But then has no root, having little, it says, um, it says that they will receive, receiving tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. So what, what, what stage are you on? First stage, second stage, where you receive the word with happiness, but the word doesn't grow and has no root. And now you have a third stage. Now he who received the seed, the thorns, among the thorns, it's he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of the riches choke the word. So here you see that there was some growth. There was already growth. So it's better than the prior stage. But it's, but, but the riches and the deceitfulness of the riches is is not is not allowing the seed to grow you love the word you want to follow the lord but you still love this world the world still is able to work in your heart and using the riches the word does not fructify in us so we need to develop ourselves until we go to the fourth stage. The one who was sown into the good land. This is the one that listens and hears the word and understands it. This one bears fruit at a 30, 60, and a hundredfold. And when the Lord comes back, this is the one that will reign with the Lord for a hundred, for a thousand years. So this is why we need to cleanse our hearts. So here, John, I think it's chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Verse 15, do not love this world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, does not love the Father. Both the Father and the world do not fit on the same place. If you love the world, the love of God is not in you. Because all that is in the world, the last of the flesh, so the world has everything or something for all types of likings. If you are into sensual, sensuality, sexuality, uh, if you are filled with lust, the world has its department for you. But if you're more refined, you're more, more studious, the world also has something for you. There is something for aesthetics, for entertainment. Uh, just uh, there is just uh, the last, the, the best car that comes out, the mo the best cosmetics for women, the best clothing for women or for men. The world has everything needed to capture your heart. So that's the, that is the last of the eyes. And then we see here, we see here the following. The passions of this, the lust of the flesh, and then you see the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. This is all speaking about the lust of the soul. 
referring to all the things, uh, um, arrogance, feeling superior, feeling proud. All of these things are given by the world and occupy the heart of men. So Satan then uses this powerful, this powerful um, tool to maintain control over men. Do you think that man likes to be by Satan's side? No. But how is Satan obtaining such a control over the world? It's through these, through these things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the, and the suburb, suburb of, of the life. All men, all people run after money and the law for the for the for the money controls the world oh i love other things yes but those things are also of the world they like power that all that's also of the world the vainglory of this life is also of the world all is under the power of satan of the enemy there is no space for god because our hearts are occupied with these things and this is why the world lies under the evil one. Now, we can see this in 1 John. 1 John 5.19. We know we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. This word lies uh, it refers to something that is dead. You know, the, uh, um, a dead person, they lie in, in, their, in, the, in the grave, right? So Satan uses, uses this world and uses the different elements of the world as a puppet to control men. Controls men through the world, the love of the world, and all of the things that the money provides he provides he controls the nations through through all these elements through politics for instance what do politicians run after is it, it's either money or power or more power to have more money and that's why the world controls it controls that system so to overcome the evil one what do we need to do we need the word so let's take a look at 1 John 2.14. So I'm going to read the second, the second part of the verse. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. How do you overcome the wicked one? Through the word. So what are we doing? We're doing immersion in the Word. We're transcribing the Word. We are taking notes of the Word. We're speaking to each other with the Word. We allow the Word of God to abide in us richly, teaching each other, admonishing each other. We, we go to bed listening to the Word. We wake up listening to the Word. And what are we doing? We're filling our hearts with the Word. And that is the way in which we can overcome the evil one. And we can do this by allowing the Word of God abiding in us. The evil one is defeated. So let's continue. There in chapter 2. First, so through through our good deeds and through our good through our good uh, behavior, um, the Lord Jesus will, you know, it's it's the time where it's speaking about the day of visitation. So this is the day when the Lord Jesus will 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 come and will be the uh, the Lord Jesus as the shepherd will visit the, all the pilgrims because they don't feel as part of a, of a kingdom. So when he's speaking about the day of visitation, it's speaking about the this this journey of the pilgrims. 
So, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of men for the Lord's sake, whether to king, whether to the king as supreme, or governors, or to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do, who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put the silent to silence, the ignorance of the foolish men, as free, yet using liberty as cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. So I like to make sure that it's clear to us that us, that we live in other nations, you know, this is talking about the Jewish, the believers. And then they could think, well, since this is not our land, this is not our nation, we can evade taxes, we can do whatever we want. But that's not the way. If you live on this earth, you need to subject yourself to the institutions of this earth. God never talked to us or told us that we shouldn't obey the institutions of this world. On the contrary, if we live on this earth, we need to obey and be subject to these institutions. So, this is also in Romans chapter 13. Romans 13, verses, verse 1. This is uh, Paul speaking to the Romans. Because many of the church in Rome were Jews that immigrated there, that immigrated to Rome. And he speaks as well, Paul here speaks as well, of honoring, honoring the uh, institutions and the government under which they abide. So let every soul be subject to the, govern the governing author authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So here is speaking about Subject, being subject to the authorities on this earth. For rulers are not for not for terror, um, but rather for good works. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is good, he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is in God's for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience' sake. So you shouldn't do it just because there is a there is a consequence or there is going to be a fee that you have to pay, but rather because of your conscience. This, for because of this you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers attending continually to these very things. Render therefore to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to who, whom customs are good, fear to whom here fear, and honor to whom honor. You know, oh, I don't give taxes. I don't tax because they 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 are they spend it wrongly. Well, that's not that's not your department. It is for you to pay, and the Lord will deal with them. Therefore, as we live on this earth today, we need to take care of our part as citizens of our countries. We live in democracies today, and the democracies uh, praise the liberty of expression. 
And in, in, in a free democracy, everybody has the freedom to speak. But us, who are us who are being governed by the Lord, we don't have the same freedom of speech because we have someone that governs us directly. He should govern our thoughts, our tongue, and our lips. So we shouldn't use the liberty and freedom for malice. But rather we need to live as servants of God because we have... a a Lord that we need to uh, render an account to. One day we'll re render accounts to the Lord. So we need to deal with everybody and treat everybody with honor and do not use defamation or deceit to speak about people. Remember, these are elements of the evil one. When you start with malice and you end up in defamation. When you cannot find anything true about a person and you start inventing or making things up with the intention of destroying. This shouldn't be our practice. We should love our brothers, our brothers and sisters. I'm already in verse 17. So, he says, honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the king. So, honor the authorities, institute it in the country you live. How is it important, how is it so important for us to understand and learn the lesson of submitting to authority. God never blesses a rebellious person. God never blesses someone that goes against the uh, uh, established authority. So you may have your political opinions, but we should never dishonor an authority, even that they are might be the worst. Or they might be very, very bad um, in, in their execution. Or we may have just different opinions. We should never dishonor the authority. Doesn't mean you have to be one or, or have be of one accord with that person. But this person has received authority, and that's the authority I should respect. Because that spirit of rebelliousness does not come from God, it comes from Satan. So we should never enter into that. This was not inside of my, in what I had prepared. Similar to what, um, and I wanted to speak something similar to this, this aspect uh, concerning David's story with Saul. In First Samuel, in First Samuel, we see an account where where um, there was a king selected. First Samuel, chapter fifteen, verse one. Samuel also said to Saul, "The Lord sent me to anoint you king over His people." over Israel. Now, therefore, heed the voice of the words of the Lord. So, even the institution of a king over Israel, even this king needed to follow what direction? He needed to heed the voice of the words of the Lord. Because in the midst of the king of the kingdom of God is God who governs. So even though that there is authority among us, that authority needs to be attentive to the word of the Lord. It doesn't mean that because the person uh, is in a in a situation or a place of authority, he can do or say whatever. No, he needs to listen attentively to the word of the Lord. Because in the church, in 
in in the people of God, it is God who um, does the government. He governs. So take a look at verse 2. So after he's been appointed as a king, there is something given here, an, attri an, an attribute given to Saul. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel, how he, uh, how he ambushed him on the way when he came up from Egypt. This is the order given by, by the Lord to Saul. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them, but kill both men and women, infant and nursing child, uh, ox and sheep, and camel and donkey. Amalek here represents the flesh. The flesh doesn't profit anything. It profits nothing. You can perfect yourself on the in the flesh, but it needs to be destroyed. So we need to be guided by the spirit instead. So do not spare the flesh. Our flesh also has a good side. But there is this good side to it. Your human, your human natural love. God does not want to use it. All of this has a spiritual meaning. So then Saul went. He fought against the uh, the Amalekites. So look at verse five and six. Mm. So we can see here that he did not he did not kill the king. They they spare the best of the of the sheep, the best of the animals, and they did not destroy them. They did destroy everything that was evil and that was um, of not the, the, and all the evil things that were in that land. He had a good intention. He thought that his good intentions were good. And he might have thought, oh, he might be a useful person. The king of uh, the Amalekites can be useful later on. So he kept him, he kept him uh, alive. And he kept the best of the land for himself. Oh, this could be good for the nation. This can also be for sacrifice for the Lord. Look, this is the opinions of your good flesh. He did not kill it. And he did not destroy it. Look at verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king, for he has turned back from following me, and he has not performed my commandments. He has not performed and executed my word. It is not for us as the church to act according to our opinions or ways. We need to act according to God. We need to obey the word of God. So Samuel became very sad, and he prayed and called to the Lord all evening. So we see here that Saul had preserved the best for sacrifices. Do you think that the Lord has more pleasure on holocaust and sacri sacrifices more than his in, in obedience? And then verse 22 says, it is better it is better to obey than to make sacrifices. So God just prefers you to obey his word. It's not a matter of op opinion about his word. If he says, uh, A, you should execute A. And then verse 26 says, I will not 
I will not speak to you again as you have rejected the word of the Lord. And you will no longer be king over Israel. He was placed as a king and then removed as a king for not obeying the word of the Lord. Wow, what a difficult situation. So if we want to be citizens of the kingdom, if we want to cooperate with the establishment of the kingdom, we need to obey the word. We need to obey the, obey the word attentively without, without removing a comma or without removing a, a, a dot. So then the Lord rose someone else. He rose up David. Now let's take a look at ver, uh, chapter 16. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I have rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I am sending you to Jeze. The, Beth, the Bethlehemite. For I have provided my, myself a king among his sons. And then, and then Samuel went and called all the children. And then in verse 7, you know, he brought, he brought the most prominent and beautiful sons of Jesse. But but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. You know, and then Jesse did not bring David. He's probably a teen. He's, he's, he did not bring, he didn't even bring him to for Samuel to see it. And so Samuel asked, is there somebody else? Samuel, Samuel asked if there was somebody else. David was working, caring for the sheep. And then Samuel asked, bring him over. He was also handsome. Verse 12. And then the Lord said to Samuel, get up, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel took the horn of the oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day on forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. It's very interesting that when the Lord anoints someone, the Spirit abides and dwells in them. So what happened? So Samuel knowing that Saul, when he found out that David was anointed, Saul wanted to kill David. But this is important for you, even though it is outside of the outline of the of the message today. I do want you to read something in chapter 21. Porque Saul procurava matá-lo. Então, no meio dessa, Verse 10, 21, 10. dessa situação, olha no capítulo 24 de 1 Samuel. David had to uh, flee because uh, Saul wanted to kill him. Now, go to chapter 24. Because David had an opportunity to kill Saul. And David did not do it. Uh, verses 3 through 6. So he came to the sheepfolds by the road where there was a cave. And so went in to attend to his needs. David and his men were staying in the recesses of the cave. Then the men... Men and David said to him, David's men said, This is the day in which the Lord said to you, 
Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, that you may do to him as it seems good to you. And David arose and secretly cut off a corner of, Saul, of Saul's robe. Now it happened afterwards that David's heart troubled him because he had cut Saul's robe. And he said to this man, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him, seeing that he is anointed by the Lord. And David said, he was anointed by the Lord, I will honor him. Our heart needs to be like David's. There should never be any any drop of rebellion in our hearts against the heart of the of the of the um, of the anointed one. Now, chapter 27. Chapter 26, verse 7. Então disse inimigo, pois agora, né? So, there was an opportunity here where Saul was sleeping, and Abishai said, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with a spear. And verse 9, he said, Do not destroy him. For who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be got, um, guiltless? And then verse 11, The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. But please, take now the spear and the jug of water that are by his head and let us go. So, even though that this was um, the king, he was going against God and he was doing everything wrong. But he did not raise up. He did not extend his hand against the anointed one. You continue, you continue um, and you wait in the Lord. You do not raise your hand against the anointed one. So the Lord doesn't like that you would have any type of uh, rebellious attitude. So we praise the Lord that the Lord has given us so many young people. That have gotten together and that they are giving support, working in the work of the Lord. So many teams, so many young people, so many uh, mighty men of David. But let's learn this lesson. Never raise up your hand against the authority. Never rise up your hands against the anointed ones. Let the Lord deal with the situation if they are making a mistake. But you should never have a heart of rebelliousness. Amen? Amen. Now verse 18. Back to Second Peter. Excuse me, back to First Peter. 1 Peter 2, 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all fear, not only to the good and Gentile, but also to the harsh, for this is commendable, it, um, if because of conscious, conscience toward God, one endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Verse 20, for what credit is it if when you are beaten for your faults, you take, you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before the Lord. So this is Peter speaking to the many brothers and sisters around these nations that were servants. So even if they had a boss, an, a boss that was evildoer and that would be harsh with them, 
If you are in a position of submission, you submit. This doesn't want, that doesn't mean that I, I agree with all the uh, unrighteousness or any unrighteous practices. Uh, the Lord will will take care of me. You always should have a portion or an attitude of a servant. This is this speaks about the Lord Jesus Himself. You know that the Lord Jesus Himself He came to the earth and He assumed the position of a servant. Isn't this in Philippians chapter 2? So we need to um, assume the same position of the Lord in Philippians chapter 2. Have the same feeling that had the Lord Jesus had. That being, being God, he did not take hold of the position of being God. But rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. The Lord Jesus himself willingly assume the form of a, of a servant in that attitude it's a it's shameful to the enemy because Satan when he was a, an angel created by the father even in the in the positive time in the in the in the heavenly realm he was given so much capacity. But he wanted to continue to climb up, climb up, climb up, climb up, and be equal to God. But the Lord Jesus, being God, he did not take hold of that. But rather, he emptied himself and became a servant. And servants don't have any type of righteous um, or rights. At this time, servant is slave. So a slave in the time of the Roman Empire didn't have any type of liberty. He didn't have any type of liberty. Who has right over him is his, is his Lord, his master. And the Lord Jesus became a servant and assumed the position of a servant. So let's continue in verse 8. And he, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death. He never complained. He never um, said anything, even though he was slapped. He was spit on. But the Lord Jesus obeyed until the death of the cross. So all of us, brothers and sisters, we need to have this attitude. We're here on this earth to be servants. I am servant of the brothers. I am servant of the people that are on the streets. I am servant of the Lord. I am always, I should always have a position or a posture of a servant. If you, if you go to the city in Cuiabá in Brazil, there is so much sun. So, so hot outside. If I come here and I start saying, oh, I, I want to be recognized. I want, I want you guys to, to, to show appreciation for me. A servant is a servant. A servant just serves the Lord. So in, in Isaiah 53, it describes very well this type of servant. So let's go to Isaiah 53, verse 2. And God could at least have given him a better appearance. But the Lord didn't even have good appearance. He was despised by the world. He was a man of pain. He was used to, used to suffering. He became used to suffering. He was despised, rejected by men. 
and we turn our faces away from him. Surely he has borne our griefs, verse 4, and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed his um, strict, stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. There was no quality, there was no type, there, was, there wasn't any type of beauty in him. No type of beauty in him. But why? He came to be, he went to, he came to be a servant. And now in verse 7, he was, he was humiliated. And he did not open his mouth, even in the moment of being betrayed and in the moment of being beaten. You can see this in Mark. Mark. Mark 14, verse 65. Some people started to spit on him. The Son of God, God Himself, that became a man, received received spits and received um, punches from people, saying, "Prophesy!" An officer struck him and slapped him in the face. This is, this is, this is terrible. This is not, have you, have you had a slap in your, in your face from a soldier? This is, this is strong. And he suffered all these things as a servant. So the four living creatures we saw in Ezekiel, they had four, four faces. Leon. And, and the first phase was the phase of man. And the second one was the, the phase of a lion, the, the phase of an ox, and then the phase of an, uh, of an eagle. The phase of a man, because it's man who is going to do the, execute the work of God. The lion, as a king, the king of the kingdom of heavens. And the Lord wants to uh, execute his kingdom here on earth. And as an eagle, he came here as, as God. He has a life that is superior to everything. But as an ox, he came to serve. To serve us. And... The ox is an animal that doesn't ask for a salary and doesn't fight for that either. Doesn't want extra hours or extra time. The only thing that the ox knows to do is to serve. To serve. You, you've seen a, a horse revolting, again, you know, with with the rider, or maybe a, a, a donkey doing that. But an ox does never, never oppose his, um, his owner or master. However, there could never be a lack of food for an ox. And he receives food so that he can execute his assignment. Now, there's another verse here. If you go to 1 Corinthians 9, 9. It says you should not bind the mouth of the servant of the ox. You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads our grain on the grain. So, yes, there is no salary for the servant, but they they must have food. 
But God is not worried about a, an ox. He's talking about the serving ones among us. So now if you go to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy. First Timothy. Excuse me, cannot be nine. I I have nine here in my outline. Looking for the verse. It's actually five eighteen. Five eighteen. Trabalhador é digno do seu salário. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads um, out the grain. And the laborer is worthy of its way of his wages. So praise the Lord, we have among us the cold porters. But they preach the gospel. And Paul says, whoever preaches the gospel, may he live of the gospel. Now, in the past, they would provide a salary to those who serve the Lord. But... That is not the right principle. Because you are giving a salary. And whoever eats, receives a salary ends up, or, or I mean, ends up having to satisfy the person that gives him the salary. But we're servants of God. We do not serve men. We serve men, but as servants of God. So it's God who needs to feed us. So that's what I say. Colporting came from God. It came so much from God that those colporters they don't they don't do colporting for money or because of the money. Because if they were to do that with with a motivation to do to earn money, it doesn't work. But when they do it because of the obedience to the word and obedience to people and, and, and obedience to God, it works. And when it works, God supplies them through the gospel. And nobody is their, is their um, boss. They live of the gospel. This is marvelous. That is wonderful. So... They cannot stop eating. They cannot stop eating. Everybody in that in that aisle, everybody is, is belly fill. Everybody's eating too much. Carlos, we, we ate a lot last night, so we need to diminish the food a little bit. Food cannot stop, cannot lack, but do not exaggerate. Now let's continue. So the Lord takes care of our sustainment. And that's why the Lord Jesus taught us in Matthew chapter 6, verses 32 through 34, to seek the kingdom of God first and all things will be added unto us because our, our Heavenly Father knows that we have a need of all of these. So God never forgets our need. If we are servants of the Lord, the Lord is our Lord. Psalms 127. Psalms 127. I have encouraged the brothers in the age of the mighty men of David. And these are brothers and that are successful. They are developing themselves professionally. There is a lot of um, uh, challenges and, and demands at work. And at the same time that they demand, there is a lot of demand in work uh, or in, in their profession, there is a lot of uh, demand from them um, or that is asked from them to spend more time at work. And then there is also a lot of demand from the family. And so little by little, there is less time for the Lord. And we cannot allow these precious brothers to spend entire life going after work. 
and have no time for the Lord. And the Lord wants to take them away from this system. Doesn't mean that they are not going to continue working. And the Lord simply wants to bless them. But how? Many of these brothers here, they were completely occupied. They had no time for the Lord. But when the Lord touched their hearts, they, they felt it was impossible to divide their time and um, the Lord started to bother them and touch their heart and realize they needed to follow the Lord closely. And as they started to get close to the word and be and, and follow closely, the Lord the Lord starts to operate miracles. And the Lord gives gives as they give more time to the Lord, the Lord does not the Lord bless them on their professional life. So the more they give to their the, to the Lord and the more they dedicate themselves to the Lord, the Lord does miracles in their human life. And there is miracles even in their professional life. And little by little they realize that the Lord wants their heart. So if they have a heart to dedicate themselves to the Lord, the Lord takes care of their business. They don't need to leave their businesses or their professional life. But in the midst of so many things, they 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 accept the challenge from the Lord to follow closely. Many of them in São Paulo, they can tell you that testimony. They are so useful in the in the work of the Lord. But they give themselves to to to, to the work. Many of these brothers and these brothers in that had no time at all for the church. They are now the ones that are coordinating the, the conference in South Africa. But everything starts with our heart. The most important point is to allow the Lord to work in your heart by following the, the, the word closely. So this verse that I'm going to read is for these mighty men of David. It says, useless, unless the Lord, um, verse, verse 2, it says, it is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for he gives his beloved asleep. Many, many have to, Make money so that you, that you have to stress out, you have to run, you have to get up early, go to bed late. You have no time for the Lord. But the time that you decide to give time to the Lord, the Lord is going to give you while you sleep. But you have to decide. Oh Lord Jesus. So there is no glory in suffering because your own of your own mistakes. There is no grace with that. So it's not a matter of supporting the suffering or enduring the consequences of sin or the consequences of your mistakes, but rather to follow the path of the Lord. So continue with our reading. First Peter, chapter 2, following the steps of Christ, verse 20, um, 21, for to this we were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Porque hoje nós temos a mesma vida. So we can we can follow the same steps of Christ because we have the same life that allowed Christ to endure such a pain, such a suffering, 
on our behalf. So, as we've seen in, in Isaiah chapter 53, the Lord suffered and endured sufferings and He did not open His, his mouth. And He stayed, he stayed um, quiet for the entire time. When He was when he was um, where he went through suffering the Lord Jesus did not reply back he did not open up his mouth and we need to learn the same so let us look at Romans chapter 12 we need to learn we need to learn to not pay our transgressors with the same with the same payment do not pay anyone with the same coin Romans chapter 12, verse 17. Brother Dong, he never repaid with the same type of payment when he was um, ill-spoken. We do not use the same weapons as, as the darkness because we need to trust the Lord who judges. So do not repay evil with evil. Now, we also see a verse here in Thessalonians. Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 5.15. Do good with each other and with everyone. We need to follow the path of the Lord Jesus. It doesn't mean we shouldn't, we shouldn't be wise so that the work of the Lord is not damaged. If, if somebody uh, insults you, you're not going to reply back with the same insult. But it doesn't mean we shouldn't be careful with the work of the Lord and make sure that, you know, we do, we do not suffer any, any, any damage. Paul, when he was martyred, he was abandoned by all the people and all the people he cared for, all the churches that he suffered for such a long time, for three and a half years. And we can see that in 2 Timothy 2.15. Everybody from Asia abandoned Paul. But even with this, he knew that he had fulfilled and finished his race. And that should be our attitude. We do our part. Everybody should do their part. Being faithful to the Lord. And trusting the Lord that He's the one that judges. He's the, right, the righteous judge. So, Paul says, For this you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. So even though that everybody from Asia had abandoned him, he knew that the Lord was the, the faithful judge, had a crown of righteousness for him. But as for me, 2 Timothy 4.8, the Lord has reserved for me a crown of righteousness. That should always be our, our righteousness. Our righteousness comes from the Lord. We owe the Lord all our, uh, our, all our service and the Lord, from the Lord comes the righteous payment. So verse 24, Caring in himself all carrying in himself the weight, the weight of our sins. And those who die on a cross were cursed and became cursed. So the Lord Jesus. Die, dying for us on, on, a, on, a, on a cross, he became a curse on our behalf. Now in Galatians 3, 3 and 14, 13 and 14. 
thanks to the Lord. Amen. Oh, three, three, fourteen says, Christ has rescued us from the curse of the law, becoming a curse on our behalf, because it is written, curse, it is written, curse is anyone that is hung upon a cross. So that the, the blessing of Abraham would reach us, Gentiles, in Christ Jesus, so that we would receive the promised spirit. If the Lord Jesus had said, oh, I'm not going to become a curse for those men, we wouldn't have had received the blessing of the Spirit. So we received the bless, the promised Spirit. And He came as a servant willing to serve us. Now you could see, you could see now the, the last few verses. Deus criou o homem para receber a sua vida. Amen. So you see the end of verse 25 says, For you were like sheep going astray, but have, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. So the Lord put the tree of, of life in the middle of the garden because he wanted man to receive this life. And man would lack nothing with this life. But the but we as men chose the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and death passed to reign in men. And now, all that man has to receive, unfortunately, is what Ecclesiastes says. Solomon said, it's vanity of vanities. This life, it's all only made out of vanities. This world doesn't offer you anything. Only that, that only whatever um, becomes tiredness. Oh, I wanted to be a millionaire. Solomon enjoyed everything. He enjoyed everything, every privilege, and he, his conclusion that was that everything is vanity. So when, man, when God wants to govern man through his life, God wanted to supply man in all his tripartite being. But what is most, most difficult to, to satisfy is the soul. So when man fell in the world, in the kingdom of Satan, he did not have any hope. He was completely tangled with all these uh, illusions, earthly illusions that do not satisfy man. So comfort, entertainment, pleasures of the flesh, money, the vainglory of life, nothing satisfies man. But this is why Jesus was sent to preach the gospel of the kingdom. Only the kingdom of God in life can satisfy us truly. Only the, only the word of God can satisfy us. Matthew 4.4, 4, not only of bread shall men live, but out of all the words that proceed of the mouth of God. So in Matthew 9, you know, he saw, Jesus saw the multitudes like sheep without a shepherd. This world cannot, cannot take care of our souls. Without the care of God's life, the soul of man suffers. Think about this. What is on our shoulders? I'm not talking about our physical shoulders, our soul. What is on, on, on our shoulders? 
it's um, you know fighting to survive survive you know the the sustainment sustainment and being able to live the money you know the income creates such such a, a burden it's such a burden in our lives de alcançar sucesso. Isso é mais um sofrimento, é ou não é? Todos nós estamos And then we have all the psychological pressures of reaching of being successful. Everybody striving to be successful. To be prosperous. And then together with all the the, the social responsibilities all the uh, responsibilities for the family provide to the children provide to the family all of that creates such a responsibility and then men men can just implode and live in a world of anxiety and anguish leading to depression we become like sheep without a shepherd but praise the Lord, we have converted to the shepherd and overseer of our souls. He truly, truly knows how to take care of our soul. We were regenerated through the uncorruptible seed. And we do not want to come back to these um life of vanities and if you remember we talked about that the life of man is just like like a little like a little plant you know that it's 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 so it's so vain it's so short it dies away so let's live what it's permanent so who satisfies my soul but the word of the lord remains eternally the word of god can supply us eternally so the satisfaction the Lord can provide to our soul is also eternal. So the prophetic word, the prophetic word that we are listening week by week, day by day, is what truly can provide satisfaction to you. Do you believe in this? If you do not invest, if you do not invest in putting the prophetic word into you, you're going to continue to live in a world of insecurities, anxieties, and depression. Let's, let's move away from that. Let's immerse in the world, in the word. Let's go out to preach the gospel. Let's go out to, come, to do the come and see. Allow the word to circulate. You're going to be cured of depression. You're going to be cured of anxiety. And our soul will be shepherd. And the Lord will not allow any plates, any food, sustainment to be removed from your house or to lack in your house. The Lord will take care of you.